you please help me in welcoming Tanya Higginsdorf, who will give us one Michigan success story. everything I was going to say, but much better. So we'll, we'll see how this goes. So I'm here to tell you just how uh, our shelter's experience in improving our save rate. So not to pat ourselves on the back, but to say, you can do it too. I'm going to say a lot of things that Debbie said. Uh, hopefully it will be helpful. And I know we have a pretty diverse group here, so Bear with me. I'm going to quickly go through our through our own history, 2004. Okay, so 2004, uh, Eugene Sider here on Bailey had a budget of 1.6 million dollars, and in that year we had a loss of 250 thousand dollars, which created a huge crisis in the organization. We laid off 25 percent of our animal care staff. The fourth executive director in six years, four executive directors in six years. Just walked out of the agency one day. On. Right? <laughs> was she one of those compassionless leaders, perhaps? <laughs> People kind of booted her out, maybe. I say excellence in mismanagement was an example. It was uh, not run very well, not good policies and procedures, no solid infrastructure in place, no fundraising, no finance staff, things that you need to run an organization well. And I would say open hostility between board staff <laughs> and volunteers and members. We had members then too. And people just pretty much hated each other. They fought constantly, didn't respect each other, didn't know how to come to an agreement, lots of distrust. And then that conflict hit the papers. Does that sound familiar? Is it like every other week some shelter is going through something like this, where people don't know how to get along? So today, our budget is nearly tripled. We have a new state-of-the-art shelter with a high-volume spay-neuter clinic. The shelter we replaced was almost 60 years old. It's falling apart in every way possible. New programs and services, 70 employees and over 500 volunteers. Management Excellence Award, four-star charity navigator, Three years in a row. <laughs> Not satisfied, but much happier. So this is an this is a chart that shows our sterilizations. In 2010, we had 70 over 7,300 sterilizations, and we're we're growing. This is a chart showing our adoption. And this is a chart. Our save rate is now 81.29%. 2004 was about 50%. So that this is the euthanasia drop. So that's where you want adoptions up, sterilizations up, euthanasia down. Simple math. So, how did we do it? We did it with a lot of the things that Debbie talked about. First of all, you do have to have effective leadership and management in place. Management is very important. New programs and services, or TNR, very critical. And the way you do things, not just what you're doing, but the way you do them is very important. So we'll talk a little bit about leadership principles that are important. Obviously, this group doesn't have trouble staying focused on the mission, but knowing what your mission is is very important. <laughs> uh, being accountable 
and outcome driven. So who owns your organization? Is it your executive director? Is it your board members? Is it your staff or your volunteers? No. If you are a nonprofit or a county animal control facility, you are owned by the community. That's who owns you. Your donors and your taxpayers who are paying your bills. And that's who you are accountable to. You need to measure your outcomes and you need to report them. Right? You are spending other people's money. Integrity. This is a hard one. You have to do what you say you are doing. And figure out how to do that. A lot of us are really good at talk. You know, some organizations that are really good at PR and saying they're doing some phenomenal thing. And we think most of their animals are going in the freezer. So what is it that they're really doing well? We don't know. But they're good at convincing other people that they're doing well. Do what you say you're doing. And find out. Make sure. If you're a leader in the organization and you think you're doing something, you think your staff are doing something, you change something, go and see it for yourself. Because it's hard to make change and it's hard to get people to do, to change habits. You need to see that it's really happening. Because people are resistant to change, right? We, we're slow learners. <clears throat> Innovation and courage. So try something new and don't be afraid. I say take risks. You can't win if you don't play. Got to take risks. You're not doing it for yourself, you're doing it for the animals. You're doing it for the mission. Great customer service. Debbie went over this. You've got to have hours. You are retail, basically. When you're trying to adopt out animals, you are retail. So you got to invite people into the door. People have got to be able to get there. They gotta be able to, and they gotta feel good when they're there. They gotta want to be there. Those are some essential keys. Make them feel good when they come. Be accessible. The hedgehog concept that comes from Jim Collins, Good to Great, I highly recommend it as a book. Only do what you do well. Don't try to do everything. Do what you think you have the, the resources to do well. Support, supportive strength-based supervision. This is really hard work. It takes a lot of physical toil and it takes a lot of emotional toil. It means you have to support the people doing, doing the job. And look at their strengths. What are they doing well? What can they do well? And put them in that position. And transparency is really important. It's a lot of what today is about too is all big decisions, all of your outcomes, all of your financial information should be available for the world to see. Again, that's, a, that's about who you are accountable to. You're accountable to your community, to your donors, to your staff, to your animals, to your board members. There shouldn't be anything hidden. When I started in, in 2005, I went to my first board meeting and a board member handed me a financial packet and she said, lock this in the closet in your office. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it had a big check in it. <laughs> <laughs> That's not the way to do things. If you have to lock things up and hide things from people, stop doing it. <laughs> Just stop doing it. Really. If you can't be proud of it, don't do it. You can't support it, not the thing to be doing. We shouldn't be hiding things. We should be proud of what we're doing. And I think we all do better when we're being watched. We all act a little bit better. We parent better, we take care of our animals better, we supervise better, and somebody's watching us. That's a, part of the reason for religion. <laughs> is watching you. <laughs> Obviously following best practices, being at a place at, at this conference, really important, about learning new and different ways of doing things, keeping yourself up to date, 
PetSmart Charities has wonderful webinars on the website and their website. You can learn just about anything through, some, through one of their webinars. Um, the Shelter Vets Association just put out standards of care and shelters and animal control. You have to read that. You have to, you have to know this is, a, this is a really evolving science in terms of animal care, in terms of uh, veterinary care, in terms of behavior. Stuff is changing every day. So you have to learn it. You have to, you have to stay abreast. If you are not spot cleaning your cat cages, whack yourself on the back and go back and figure out what that is and do it. Really. So, effective leadership. First figure out where you're going. That's your mission. Then figure out who is going with you. Where am I going and who is going with me? Who are the people who are going to help me get there? I say bring the people with the right stuff. Knowledge, courage, drive, dependability, and obviously team players. No one of us is smart as all of us together. We need to be team players. And programs. <coughs> reducing, obviously reducing overpopulation. Debbie said, we gotta make it available and affordable. Free and low cost spay neuter. No animal in your shelter or rescue should be leaving unsterilized. No animal in your shelter or rescue should be given any care. And if you don't have the money to do it, go get it. Because then you don't have enough money to do what you're supposed to be doing. Free pit bull sterilizations. Not all of us have pit bull problems, but we in Washington County love our pit bulls, but we have way too many of them. We go through our shelter. We went through our shelter. Pit bull, pit bull, pit bull, never. Pit bull, pit bull, pit bull, chihuahua. <laughs> but today when they weren't all pit bulls, but we've got to get them sterilized and euthanizing them as we can. We do low cost right now. It's our, we call it the year of the cat. So we're doing 2011 sterilizations for all of our cats. Uh, we do free uh, sterilizations for animals that are returned to their owners, the strays that are picked up, and parents of litter. So if you come to us and your dog or cat had a litter of kittens, we say bring that mama in so we can sterilize her. We do that for free. Obviously track neuter return, which you'll learn more about. Very critical. Healthy wild animals don't belong in your shelter. Programs to support owners, we talked about this, behavior helpline. So how do we help people keep their animals? We have to talk to them about what the behavior, behavior problem is that one of the number one reasons people relinquish their animals. So helping them before, it, the statistics say that people spend about three months deciding to get rid of their pet. So having resources and support before they get to your shelter door is really critical. Before they get to the shelter door and they've already made up their mind and been through that grief process. Bountiful goals, that's our pet food program. So you're having trouble feeding your animal, you love your animal, you want to keep your animal, we want to help you keep your animal too. We want it to be fed. Uh, veterinary hardship. So we provide a lot of free and reduced cost services to people who are having are struggling economically and can't afford to take to provide critical veterinary care for their animals. How tragic is it that people go to the vet and something very treatable for their animal and they're gonna have to spend fifteen hundred dollars. I mean everybody knows that veterinary care is extremely expensive. So we 
want to try to help people keep their animals. Our pro program, so we will temporarily house people's animals if they run into a housing crisis. So domestic violence situations, uh, hospitalizations, even on occasion when somebody goes to jail. <laughs> uh, their animal, and criminals love their animals too. <laughs> So, whatever we can do so that we don't have to take responsibility for that animal and then rehome it. If it has a loving owner, we want to help that loving owner keep their animal. And loss and help sounds really important. All of our stray animals that come in, lost, strays are just lost animals, um, are up on our website. So, if you lost your dog, you can go to our website and say, did that animal come in to me because I was there on bail. But the more help we can give people, like Debbie said, that's I in their path to returning home is much different. We currently return about 50% of our dogs and about 5% of our cats. But we can do better. But we can do better. But we have to educate people on how to find their animals. Kelly. <laughs> A few more programs. Talked about foster care. So about a third of our animal, our shelter animals, actually go to foster, our, spend time in foster care. Either they're babies, or they're sick, or they have behavioral issues, or they hate the shelter. And that's a really important option for shy and fearful animals that just aren't, aren't doing well. Some dogs look really aggressive. Some cats look feral, but really aren't. They just can't handle the stress of the shelter. So having different options for them, foster care is really critical for that. Uh, animal enrichment, keeping your animals sane is very important in your shelter. Debbie talked about Livingston County. Uh, I had mixed feelings about Livingston County. It, uh, not euthanizing because I felt like those animals were really suffering in those cages. Luckily we had somebody come and, and change that, but the way they were treating the animals, I didn't look in those cages and say, I want those animals to live longer. Because it was really quite horrible. But that's changed now, but that's wonderful. Uh, obviously, veterinary treat treatment needs to be available to those that are treatable. Sorry. 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 Is uh, my munchkin in one of our fosters. Yes, yeah, so, well, a one sparrow kitten. <laughs> So let's talk a little bit about cats, because I think cats is a big struggle. Nationally, they say 75% of cats are euthanized, that go into shelters, don't keep. And that's where our biggest area of improvement was with cats. It was when we were euthanizing nearly about 70%, actually. So and cats are more difficult. They don't. Uh, speak the, the, uh, a language that is as easy for us to understand as it is for dogs. It's much more subtle. You have to listen more closely. So we need people who understand cats in our shelters and rescues. We're going to provide them good care. We need people to do the behavioral assessment for a cat to say, am I feral? Am I a little unsocial? Am I shy? Or am I just scared to death? Somebody needs to be taking the time to calm, to soothe, to see what am I and what do I need from here. We all need to reduce stress in the care of our, our uh, of our cats. Cats are very sensitive to stress. It makes them aggressive and it makes them sick. And if if you have cats hiding in your litter <coughs> hiding in litter boxes need to do something to change the stress in your shelter. They should have ample space. They should have soft bedding, four inches minimum is what they say. Their litter boxes should be at least three feet away from their food. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 
she's like, do you have your pizza served while you're sitting in the toilet? <laughs> You know, I, I think a, a lot of times we get into this field and we take the resources that we have and we try to do the best we can, but sometimes the best isn't good enough. Sometimes we shouldn't be doing stuff if we can't do it well. Please socialize your kittens. Yes. Really, our biggest struggle in our shelter is finding homes for cats that weren't properly socialized as kittens that are afraid of everything. They have such a struggle being in home. They have such a struggle in the shelter. They are the ones I think we are euthanizing the most. Is those cats who are not properly socialized as kittens. And if you're going to do it well, you need to do it before eight weeks. Right? It can be done later, for sure. You know, with a lot of dedication. But the longer you wait, the faster the window closes. So, you really need to socialize those kittens. We say. Uh, Life in a cage is no life. Well, life under the bed is no life either. You know, and if you, you're adopting out cats that spend their lives terrified of the world and living under somebody's bed, that doesn't make sense. That's a very good life. Understanding and treating URI. URI is very complicated. And it usually comes from stress and our spreading it to the animals. So euthanizing an animal that you made sick just need to question that, <laughs> right? And that happens a lot. These uh, shelters aren't treating URI. After we, we stressed them out, and we made them sick coming into our shelter, and in our old shelter, about 50% of the cats became sick. And that was because of, it was a sick facility. It was a stressful facility. We made them sick, and then we put them down. Uh, assessing elimination issues. Thank you, Debbie. Right? It's a lot of people do not understand litter box. We assess all of the cats that come in with litter box problems. That means we look at you and see if you have a UTI, and many of them do. Surprisingly, people have not gotten the veterinary care that they need, and they have UTI. Mm -hmm. Others just need better habits at home. People just don't know about litter box and how to, keep, how to keep healthy habits at home. So automatically euthanizing an animal, a cat, because it has litter box problems is pretty arbitrary without really understanding what's going on. Uh, force foster to adopt, that means the cats that aren't uh, adjusting to the shelter, again, the, the shy ones, the fearful ones, go into a foster home and they stay there until they get adopted. And the Farm Buddy Program, this is one we're very fond of, and this helps us with the unsocial cats. So we adopt out for free sterilized cats to people who can provide them uh, happy care in, in a barn-like setting. They have warmth, they have food, but they're not cats that are social enough to live in a home. And so they're going to live a happy life in somebody's barn. So this program has been really critical to help us saving some of those cats that are too unsocial to live in somebody's house. So some. Oh. So again, when we go into practices, we think, "Why am I here?" Question dogma. That's what you hear over and over and over again. The people, like Debbie said, that people have been saying for 40 years, question it and see if it's right. If somebody wants to adopt a cat and they have an unsterilized chihuahua at home and you don't want to adopt them that cat, what are you afraid of? <laughs> How many of you have uh, pets at home? <laughs> How many of you are 100% up to date on your vaccinations? Oh. Oh, <laughs> hi. Oh, hi. <laughs> 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 Irresponsible. Oh, my. I think I'm just going to 
going back to Debbie's point about what is loving, responsible care, and how it looks Let's not be too strict on our doctors. So for those of you who are running animal control facilities, we need to think about are we animal welfare or are we nuisance control? Our job as animal welfare is to promote the well-being of animals in our community. Euthanasia does not reduce overpopulation. It just doesn't. We just know it now. It doesn't reduce overpopulation. We know it with feral cats and feral cat colonies and how it creates that vacuum effect and allows more to come. And I believe it in a community. I believe when we're just systematically getting rid of extra animals for the community, just more will come. So we have, that's right, right? The backyard breeders or whatever. It doesn't, it doesn't solve it. You are not the exterminator. For those of you taking in feral cats because people find them to be a nuisance, you're not the exterminator. No, you just need to know that in your head. This is not my, what is my mission? What am I here to do? You will not make everyone happy. If you are making everyone happy, you aren't doing anything. <laughs> you can make some enemies, right? You cannot make everyone happy. You make the right people happy. You will not make everyone happy. People will complain. When you change the way you do things, your staff will complain. Your volunteers will complain. Your donors will complain. Your board will complain. To be a leader means you need to figure out and be dedicated to what you think is right. We have will. Take the Hippocratic Oath. First, do no harm. As I tell Debbie, this is what keeps me up at night. <laughs> this happens. We know this happens. This is, what is this about? This is about convenience and not seeing the animal as a living creature. And my job is to hold and exterminate. I'm not really feeling any human connection to this life. This is what shelters do. You know, uh, Debbie and I have, a lot, have had some conversations about the uh, no-show title. And one of the things that I find so horrific is there are organizations who want to abide by no-kill in a mistaking way that allow animals to die in their shelters instead of euthanizing them. They just languish and die. That's not our job, for sure. We don't want to do harm. If we're doing harm, we shouldn't do it. Let somebody else do it. Follow the five freedoms. How many, how many of you know the five freedoms? This is a really great guide to, to be assessing and judging how you're doing things. Freedom from thirst and hunger. Do our animals have access to fresh water and a good diet that maintains health and vigor? Freedom from discomfort. A good environment including shelter and a comfortable resting area. Again, not having to sleep in my litter box. <laughs> Freedom from pain, injury, and disease. That means if we have somebody coming in in pain, we're treating it. We're dealing with it. We're reducing that pain. We're treating that illness or that injury. And we're doing it quickly. We're not letting it languish. Freedom to express normal behavior. That's really important for our cats and dogs. What do they need to do? They need space. They need facil good facilities. They need company. They need human company. They need company from species of their own kind. They need to play. What is their normal behavior? Freedom to be who I am. That's why life in a cage is no cage, because that's not who they are. Freedom from fear and distress. And that's really important for us. Is how do we ensure we have conditions that don't create mental suffering? That's part of doing no harm, is not creating mental suffering. So in our shelters, we also want to be looking at each animal as an individual. We want to be moving those animals through as fast as we can. We want clear 
policies and procedures, and remember the devil is always in the details. Always in the details about how you do something. Debbie talked about this. So in our culture, what conditions are you treating and what do you have the resources to treat? So you have to know that ahead of time. Okay, some things you can do and some things you can't, but you have to know what can I do and what can I do well. Lovely Herculean. <laughs> Focusing on adoptions, again, this goes back to, we want to make good matches. Don't be too strict. Nobody likes adoption Nazis. <laughs> <laughs> That's been the case at the case. I, I, I helped my parents get a, a, a dog from a rescue, and it was like I was asking to carry explosives on a plane. <laughs> what is the deal? Uh huh. Educate versus judge. Most of us want to do well. If you're starting with somebody who can love the animal, then teach them how to be a good animal owner because they're going to be motivated. <coughs> Again, always provide great customer service. You have to make people feel well who want to come to you. They have to. And most of those rescues who aren't answering the phones or shelters with ridiculous hours. You gotta be available, you gotta be friendly, you gotta be helpful. And use the web. Hopefully everybody's using Pet Finder. Yeah. And uh, Really recommending PetPoint as a shelter management tool. It's an excellent tool. They also have something like PetFinder now called PetTango. That's really great. Use Craigslist. Use Facebook. Use your technology. That's where people are. No. Really good. Volunteers, obviously. I know we have a lot of volunteers in the room. Let's take this job seriously. It is a serious job. Volunteers should be managed like unpaid staff. Their job should be clear and defined. Right? They have a right to know what you expect of them. And they deserve training and support. They're just like staff, except they're not paid. It's really cool. <laughs> we pay in appreciation. And obviously, volunteers get paid, but love from the animals too. We know that, but we want to appreciate them. But we want to treat them with respect and uh, really value the skills and the talents and the time that they give to us. And that means we take it seriously. It doesn't mean they get to run the show though. You need to be clear about your decision making process. Uh, you want an inclusive process, but you don't want too many cooks in the kitchen. Right? You want to be clear about what direction you're going in. All over the place and it becomes chaos. Questions? Okay, this is for our animal controls and open admissions. I am an open admissions shelter, but I call I call us a modified open admissions. So what that means is I'm not going to euthanize one healthy animal for another healthy animal. It's just not going to happen. Uh, one day I had a woman come in with a cat. She was coming from another county. And she was bringing it to us because she thought it had a better chance of being adopted in our shelter. She always used our shelter. We were full. And we didn't have any room for that cat. And the fuller you get as a shelter, the more you put your animals in jeopardy. As Debbie said, you have to care about the individual, you have to care about the herd. And the fuller you get, the more you jeopardize the health and mental well-being of the animals that are in your care. So we were full. She insisted we take that cat. She insisted we take that cat. So I said, could you come to the back, to, back with me and show me which animal you want me to kill so I can take this one for you? Yeah. Open, I say open admissions doesn't have to mean out of control admissions. It really doesn't have to. This is how we question old thinking. Can we prioritize intake based on need of the animals and the people? I'm in dire straits. I'm homeless. I got nowhere to go. 
My wife is having a baby. We're going to get rid of this cat. I think you're right. Most people are responsible people. You don't, you don't realize we're doing it. You think the animal is in Wait jeopardy, the summer. then take it. But not everybody who says they're going to throw it in the river is really going to throw it in the river. Otherwise, they wouldn't be in your shelter in the first place. You just need to question some of those things. Right? We, don't have to, we don't have to let everybody decide our priorities for us. Gains of care. This is really important for some shelter. The longer you hold on to an animal, the more it is at risk for health and behavioral problems. So you want to move it through quickly. That doesn't mean euthanize. That doesn't mean, mean euthanize more animals. It just means whatever is going to happen with this animal, I want it to happen quickly. That's in the best interest of the animal. The same with the rescues. If you have fosters, you only have so many fosters, and you, one of your animals is sitting in foster for six months, because you're not pushing the adoptions or you're not answering the phone, so that foster can't help another animal, right? Stay efficient, provide prompt care and prompt action. I'm going to go back to days of, days of care for a minute because this is a financial issue. If you, and everybody's going to have to do some math. If you have 10 animals with an average of 10 days of care, any pens out, and it costs you $25 a day to take care of those animals. How much money is that? If, if you have 10 animals with an average of 20 days of care times $25, how much is that? It's double. You just doubled your cost. So the longer you hold on to the animals, the more cost you're taking in, right? And it's like having more animals. So the quicker you move them through, the more you can serve, the more money you save. Okay? <laughs> Compassion and objectivity. I'm going to throw that in there because we need to be objective. The animal's interest should always come first. It's in a cage, there's no life. Some questions to ask yourself. This goes back to euthanizing and what no kill means. Do you avoid euthanasia because you can't handle the grief? We see that a lot. We see that with owners. We see that with people working in rescues and shelters. You can't do it because of you. You gotta take yourself out of the picture. It's not about you. Do you choose euthanasia because it's an easy solution? We don't like to admit it, but sometimes we do that. Right? It's the easier thing to do than trying to figure out what is wrong with this animal, or where is it going to go, or what can I do with it. Are you making animals live in conditions that you would otherwise find objectionable? Are they living in little crates? Did you take that animal from a hoarding situation and put it in another hoarding situation that is your so-called shelter? <laughs> Do you care more about the about the saving the life of the animal than the quality of life of the animal or the adopter? We want to make good matches. We don't want to make people miserable. So saving aggressive animals or animals with serious uh, medical issues so that the person adopting that animal is then miserable for the next five to 10 years, that's not really fair either. It's not fair for the animal and it's not fair for the person. I got one of my dogs from a, from a rescue, and uh, that was before I worked in animal welfare. And that rescue only cared about the life of the animal. And they didn't tell me a single fact of truth as it relates to that animal. And he, that beautiful shepherd, we fell in love with his face, was dog aggressive, cat aggressive, couldn't ride in the car, couldn't go to the dog park, couldn't be walked. What was I going to do with that dog? Well, we kept her, but she was a huge burden and emotional stress on me and my family. So that's important to remember when we're shifting the burden of an animal that has huge problems. That's that. Something to think about. We end it with, we are kept from our goal, not by our obstacles, but by a clear path to a lesser goal. I appreciate all of your attention 
and um, all of your amazing work. Thank you very much.